Welcome everyone to APM Conference 2021. We are glad that you can join us. So in this session, we'll be talking about test automation on the living room devices with Andy Chamak. So without further delay, I hand it over to you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Um, hello, everybody, Andy here. And uh, as Alicia mentioned, the topic is a living room device test automation and uh, how APM 2.0 can affect this niche market for automation. So first, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm a product manager at a company called Sweetest, and uh, we are focusing on uh, test automation on the living room devices. Basically, the whole talk is a uh, collection of our experiences, what kind of problems we can uh, see in this area, and uh, what is the typical way of solving those problems, how you can do that, and uh, how Appium 2.0 would affect the, uh, the the common issues that people have in when um, testing on the living room devices. So let's first dive into what is a living room device. Uh, what kind of beast is it? Um, it's pretty much any device that has a big screen uh, and meant to be um, uh, used for consumption of media content. So uh, things like video on demand, Netflix, YouTube. Uh, and so on. And uh, this encompasses quite a big uh, number of different devices, different platforms. Uh, it includes smart TVs, setup boxes, media consoles, gaming consoles, streaming sticks, and so on. Quite a huge range of devices. Uh, can you please raise your hand who is actually doing some test automation right now for the um, for the living room devices, um, there should be a button in, in, in the Zoom to do that. And I will check the results uh, then later on. All right, so why should we care about uh, test automation on living room devices? It's such a niche market and uh, would probably affect only a few people, right? Well, um, the market is actually growing quite fast. Um, you can see that from the report by, by Sandvine. Sandvine is a network intelligence company. They are doing um, uh, different researches on the network traffic on the internet. And uh, according to their estimate in 2018, 2019, uh, about 60% of all internet traffic was a video traffic, which is um, mind blowing actually. Uh, yes, video are heavy, they are, um, they take a lot of space and uh, require a lot of resources to transfer, but still 60% is quite a huge number. And uh, what's even more interesting is that Netflix takes 15% of the whole global network traffic uh, worldwide. It's just one company, Netflix. And uh, the other big um, content providers like YouTube are not far behind. So, um, another interesting thing that we can see from this chart is a trend. Um, of course, two data points is not quite enough, but we still can see the trend that uh, video content um, is increasing the share of video content in the global, um, global internet. It's not an absolute numbers, it's a percentage from the global traffic. So the share is increasing while the share of uh, biggest uh, content providers like network and YouTube is decreasing. And um, of course, there is a slight chance that Netflix and YouTube just created some new encoder in 2019 and the video traffic went down. But um, I think the more plausible explanation is that there are just so many new vendors, new applications, new services that provide video on demand content that they are um, basically taking this share in the traffic from those big guys. And you probably seen those brands, like, uh, right? You're probably familiar with uh, names like Netflix or Apple TV, YouTube, Disney Plus, and so on. Um, and they were on the market um, for quite some time. Well, some of them are quite new, like Disney or um, Apple TV and Peacock, but some of them are uh, there from the uh, very long time, like YouTube and Netflix. And if we check the 
Wikipedia page, uh, which is, yeah, I know, not a very reliable source, but still, even Wikipedia knows of 47 video on demand services that have more than 100K subscribers for each service. So only the big players are uh, 47 of, of such video on demand services. And then you have um, countless number of smaller video on demand services of IPTV providers, pretty much every internet provider nowadays has uh, also an um, IPTV offering uh, delivered together with the, with the internet. And then uh, there is a hybrid television, European HBB TV uh, and uh, Freeview Play. And in US it's uh, ATS3 3.0 or NetGen TV. And hybrid TV is a uh, basically a broadcast channel, the, the, the regular TV plus a layer on top that is handling all that extra content, video on demand, live videos, catch up and so on. Uh, then there are dedicated catch up services and those are uh, the apps that uh, meant to provide you content that you missed in the broadcast. For example, you um, stuck in a traffic jam and you missed your favorite series or a news report on the TV. So you can just go to that service and watch it um, uh, kind of on demand. And then uh, there are live streaming apps and um, there is a huge amount of audio apps um, starting from online uh, radio and uh, ending up with uh, things like uh, Spotify when you can listen to your tunes from TV or from some smart speaker in your living room. So uh, the market is actually exploding and we can also see that in Sweetest since the recent years, we have a huge amount of new leads, uh, people who are coming to us and uh, saying that we, we now just starting to build a new app and uh, we need uh, some solution for test automation. So uh, there is a good chance that um, a lot of you will at some point uh, have to deal with uh, one of those living room devices, um, even if you're not dealing with them now. So how hard can it be? I mean, most of those applications are just HTML based and you have a quite good tools for HTML uh, apps testing, right? Well, uh, let me tell you how hard it is. Um, the market share, or sorry, the device fragmentation is a, a huge deal in uh, living room devices and smart TVs. For example, Samsung TV, uh, Samsung brand of smart TVs um, has a 32% market share in uh, first quarter of 2021. So they are a very big player. And this is a typical uh, signature for their uh, model, uh, device model. So you can see that Devices are different based on the market they are meant to. So there are US devices, there are European devices, and even within the Europe, there is a separate uh, set of devices for Germany alone. Apparently, they don't consider it Europe. Um, then uh, there are different uh, screen sizes, which does not matter that much. Uh, there is some uh, new technologies that Samsung is trying to promote. Uh, there is a screen resolution, UHD or 8K, which is very important because it will also affect the chip that is used inside of that uh, inside of that TV. Um, the bigger resolution you have, the more powerful um, CPU and GPU you need to to cover that pretty much. Um, then um, there are huge differences between different model years uh, in firmware and in hardware as well. Um, uh, there are different generations uh, of TVs. There are different tuner, again, different hardware, depending on the country and the, um, the format that it has to support. And uh, there is also design differences and manufacturing. So at the end, um, brand like Samsung can easily produce 20 to 30 models um, of the TV every year. And there are even more of them if you count uh, just a little differences like uh, screen sizes and so on. So the amount of device fragmentation, even for a single uh, TV manufacturer is just huge. And then you imagine that uh, Samsung is not the only player. There are uh, other 66% of the market uh, here and uh, uh, every single manufacturer has uh, at least several TV models per year, and uh, very often it's uh, more like tens or 
20, 30 models per year. Um, so next, um, there are some problems with testing smart TV. So uh, here is a short overview for you. Um, there is no standardized protocol for automation, right? You can have, of course, you can use Appium even now for um, Apple TV or for Android TV, Fire TV, which is nice and it works. Uh, but if you want to test something a little bit more exotic, like Samsung, Tizen, MG, WebOS, there is just no uh, out-of-box ready-made solution that you could use there. Uh, then there is also no standardized way to deploy developer application. So if you want to add ad hoc app just for testing, uh, every manufacturer does it differently. There is no standardized protocol to emulate user input because TVs are very special in that respect. You don't have a keyboard and mouse and you don't have a touch screen as in mobile devices. You have to use the remote control with infrared or Bluetooth, right? And uh, if you want to emulate that for test automation, it's not that, that straightforward. Then there is a poor or non-existent developer tools and debuggers. And uh, the virtualization is also not very good. Um, the simulator for Apple TV and emulator for Android are quite good. But when you go again to a little bit more exotic space, um, then emulators very often not represent or what the actual device can do. So they, they are missing some modules like DRM and they handle application or life cycle completely differently. So um, you cannot test a lot of use cases that you would normally want to, to test uh, in, um, in the automated way. So now let's talk about solutions, how you can test uh, with existing tools, uh, the smart TVs. Um, there are basically two big groups of solutions. Some of them are open source, some of them are um, proprietary. Uh, on the left, we have uh, object-based solutions, basically the ones that are um, getting the hard data from the device in some way and then allow you to use assertions on that data. And Epium is one of them, um, and there is a native um, framework uh, espresso for android test and xui test for and for um, tvos you're familiar with those tools as well and uh, you can use them but then for uh, other um, other smart tvs and set of boxes there is no uh, ipum solution at the moment and that is where uh, ipum 2.0 becomes very important with all the ecosystem for uh, for third party drivers that um, can fix that. Basically, uh, people, uh, vendors, and open source communities will start to produce drivers uh, for those exotic devices. And uh, Sweetest is also one of those uh, um, uh, object-based solutions. We do uh, things a little bit differently, not the same way as Appium, but uh, um, I will get back to that when we're uh, discussing uh, other topic as well. So uh, image-based solution is a huge uh, part of it. Um, and image-based is, uh, and uh, its simplest uh, implementation is just a reference image comparison. So you take a screenshot, uh, you save it somewhere. And then once you have a new version of your application, you run the same steps, and then you compare one screenshot to another. If the screenshots are uh, matching, then your test is passed, otherwise not. And uh, there are, of course, some tools that are more smart than that. They are using machine learning and uh, uh, text recognition, computer vision to uh, detect text on the, on the page. So you can also assert on text and so on. Uh, but overall, uh, yeah, they, they have their own limitations and advantages um, when you compare image-based and object-based. So uh, let's now discuss a few most common uh, pitfalls that people are uh, seeing when they try uh, the first try to automate something on the smart TV. And the first thing that you would want to do is to install my application, right? I want to install my apps on the TV uh, for testing without the need to uh, go through App Store. I want to test them before they go to App Store. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different um, platforms that 
do this differently. So you have a different API for every platform. Usually it's some sort of network API, but uh, there are also tools that are still using USB drives to install an ad hoc app. So you have to uh, put your app on the USB drive, put the USB drive into the TV, and then you'll be able to install it. And um, most of the test automation solutions that uh, I showed on the previous, um, uh, previous uh, slide actually can do an okay job for it. They are not perfect, but um, they can do a decent job installing the app uh, there for you. You just need to figure out which, which tool you're using and uh, which platform it support. Then uh, the next question that you will probably have is how do I record my screen? And you might want to record your screen for several reasons. Uh, you want to access your remote devices while you're on a home office. This was a huge topic during the COVID lockdown. I think it still is, although we are kind of climbing out of it. Uh, people want to be able to test on the devices that are in the office while they're at home. So for that, you need to see what is going on on the TV screen. Um, to get some feedback. Then for image-based testing, uh, you of course need some sort of uh, screen capturing. And then um, when you have your test run and done in automated way, you want to be able to review what was going on there on the, on the test in case it's failed uh, and uh, see where exactly the error was. So you want to have some record from the screen. So um, there are several ways how people usually do that. There is a programmatic screen grabbing, which is um, easiest one. Uh, that is what you would probably would want to use for uh, Apple TV and uh, Android based devices uh, because they provide that, but it has its limitations because of DRM content. So um, DRM is a way to protect your content from, uh, from piracy. Uh, so you need to have a specific um, decoder for the DRM content and uh, it's done on the device operation system level. So it's very low level and uh, you cannot, uh, device will not allow you to take a screenshot of DRM protected content. You will just get a black screen instead. Uh, then there are HDMI grabbing tools, um, uh, but that is kind of illegal. Uh, you will have legal issues with that. Again, HDMI has its own protocol for uh, protecting the data from uh, piracy. And although there are tools that can uh, work around it, I would highly not recommend you to use any of those. Your legal department would not be happy with that. And then uh, camera in front of the TV is a very nice option because it works for pretty much any t any device. You don't need to have a different solution for different platform, uh, but it has also its limitations. You don't get a pixel perfect image, no matter how, how good is your camera. Um, yeah, so uh, this is an example how this um, camera in front of the TV solution works from our friends at Headspin. Um, the way it works is that uh, you have a, high resolution, small TV screen, and then you have a camera in front of it. And whole this setup is um, put into a black box so that there is no external sources of light. And then uh, this box is modeled to be modular. So you can put it into the uh, server rack and have several of those server racks there. Of course, obvious limitation here is that it's not very scalable. If you need to cover a huge amount of devices, you need a lot of those boxes and uh, it will become very expensive very quickly. And also, if you have 80 inch uh, smart TV, good luck putting it into any box <laughs> like that. Um, yeah, so basically depending on uh, what, uh, what is your requirement, if your uh, app is using DRM content or if it has at all HDMI output, or in, if it's a, a relatively small device, you can choose which solution you want to use for image grabbing. Uh, then there is a topic of uh, user input emulating. For most smart TVs, it's a matter of sending infrared uh, signal from the remote control. 
and we can emulate it in several ways. The most common way is using the network API if device provides such an API. Again, smarter devices like uh, Apple TV, Android, Roku as well, some uh, gaming consoles, uh, they have API, so you can just uh, use that. And that's very easy, that's very reliable. Um, the only small uh, issue is that it does not um, cover the whole uh, the whole path of the of this um, user interaction, right? So uh, you are not sending the actual infrared signal in the same way as your end user would do that. Uh, instead, you are using uh, some sort of API. Um, so it's not exactly the same. And uh, then uh, there is a way to uh, to blast the actual infrared signal. There are a few companies that provide solutions for that. There is a Red Rat uh, that is focusing on device management. So they have a nice solution for uh, blasting infrared signals to the uh, different uh, brands of TV and also Sweetest uh, supports that. So this particular image is from our documentation. We have this bubble that you put on the TV and it is able to blast infrared signals. Uh, there are also other solutions. For example, uh, you could use a USB keyboard or some sort of simulation of USB keyboard or USB mouse uh, connected to the USB port of your TV. And usually it works nice. Uh, but the problem with that solution is that your end users are not using keyboard. Uh, you can very rarely find a user who would actually connect a USB keyboard to the TV to, to watch a TV, right? You would, they would rather use a remote control or a mobile app. And another possible solution is something called HDMI CEC. This is a protocol inside of this HDMI um, uh, stream that goes from your um, set-top box or gaming console to the TV screen. And this protocol is meant originally for uh, users to be able to use just one remote control from your uh, screen, from your TV. And then uh, over this uh, HDMI cable, it will send a signal back to the gaming console or streaming stick, and you will be able to control that uh, device like that. So. Uh, there are adapters and you can set it up in a way that uh, you will kind of inject your commands into the HDMI uh, programmatically. And it works nice, uh, but it also has its limitations. Of course, you cannot use it for TVs because TVs simply don't have HDMI output. And uh, it also has a limited set of uh, keys here. So you cannot send all possible keys. You can only send uh, some subset of them. Right. And another very common pitfall when you're testing on the TV is uh, keyboard input and uh, basically login to your application. There are two very common ways how uh, login is implemented in the app. And uh, uh, one of them would be uh, to use on screen keyboard. So you have a regular form with username, password, and so on. And uh, when you focus that uh, field, the uh, keyboard will pop up and a user is expected to use arrow navigation on the remote control and OK button to uh, punch in his credentials one letter at a time, which is extremely time consuming, but especially when you want to automate it and you want your test to run very fast, uh, but that's, uh, that's how it is. And uh, um, there are several ways how to overcome this. You can send text over, um, over the uh, network API. Some platforms allow that, some don't. And you can also try to uh, ask your developers to build some sort of backdoor for you, just a, a simple line of code that uh, you can insert the uh, basically execute JavaScript in the runtime of the app and uh, get uh, logged in. Um, but then you don't do the same uh, steps as your end user, so it's uh, somewhat limiting. And another very common way of logging in users into your application is with this uh, sign in with QR code uh, way of doing things. Um, 
The idea there is that um, user will see this on the TV screen, user will uh, get his or her mobile phone, scan the QR code, uh, log in using mobile because it's much faster, it's much easier, and then uh, the TV will be logged in automatically for, for you. Um, the limitations uh, that you will hit here is that you need basically two sessions, uh, two testing sessions, two browsers to test it, right? You, you need one on the TV to actually uh, run this application, and then you need a browser session uh, running in parallel in the same test scenario that would um, just log in you with the regular browser tools. And uh, this is another uh, reason why I think Appium will be a, a big deal here because Appium has that uh, support out of the box. You can create as many sessions, uh, as many drivers or browsers in, in a single testing session as you need. And uh, a lot of tools for uh, smart TV test automation don't do that. Mm. And once you will have a driver for TVs, you will be able to cover this use case extremely easy with Appium 2.0. Right, so um, how do I run assertion? Another common, uh, common topic. How do I get some sort of uh, confirmation that my application is working correctly? Because now, uh, let's recap. I can uh, open my app, right? I can uh, um, install it automatically, open it automatically. I can log in. I can navigate through all the menus, select a video to play and so on. But then how do I confirm that it's actually playing and that the app is actually showing me what it's supposed to show? For uh, all those tools uh, that are based on image, um, I already discussed it with you how it works. It's basically just comparing images to a reference image and uh, or grabbing a text out of the image using um, OCR. And then you can do assertions based on that. Well, Appium is uh, using a different approach, uh, is getting uh, this information from the APIs that device provides. So there is a Espresso on Android or there is a um, XCOI test for uh, tvOS and then on top of that there is Appium that kind of covers all that and using that uh, native protocols, native protocols provided by the vendor to uh, request the data needed for, for your test. And uh, here's where uh, Sweetest is uh, different because what we do, we inject our instrumentation library into the runtime of the app. So uh, we have a kind of an agent running there alongside the application. And we are able to uh, grab all the information that we need and uh, send it back over network to our server for assertions. Um, yeah, so that's how it's done depending on the tool that you select. Next, uh, I want to just give a few tips uh, based on the experience that we get with multiple customers about you know, how to keep your sanity with all this complexity, how to manage your tests, how to uh, set up your testing pipeline and processes so that it's uh, easier to, to cover everything that you need to cover. Uh, you probably have seen this uh, pyramid already <laughs> multiple times, but it is a little bit different for, for living room devices for smart TVs. Now at the bottom, uh, there are unit tests and your developers are usually covering that. So they're uh, writing user tests in their own uh, way in, in, as a part of their process. And um, then you usually have a functional or integration. Uh, I, I have here a label of end-to-end -end tests for that. And usually it's just uh, one section, uh, but I split it into two. And uh, the reason for that is that you want to have your um, business logic tested in some simulated environment. Let's say a browser for HTML based platform or a simulator for Android or Apple TV. And you can get as uh, thorough and as deep with that as you want because um, business logic uh, usually does not require any device specific APIs. And you can 
test all sorts of things like uh, logging in user there, uh, making sure that the bookmarks are working, that a video starts from the same place where it uh, ended last time and so on and so on. All this um, basically things that make your application work, uh, you can test them in a browser in a way faster way. A lot of people actually uh, you use utilize their developer team for that because there are tools for easier uh, and a very quick uh, development of tests by developers like Cypress, for example, or WebDriver EO with Appium or um, uh, things like Nightwatch. And then uh, developers are covering not only unit tests, but also covering business logic with end-to-end -end tests. And uh, the next section is the one that is most important, and that is the testing on the real smart TV, on the real deal, on the real devices. And uh, the reason uh, it's important to test on the real device is that you cannot cover everything in, in a browser or simulator. Uh, there are a lot of device specific APIs that are only available on the real device. And uh, uh, the, the um, passing of your test on the simulator will not guarantee that it will pass on a real device because of a uh, all the device fragmentation, all the different models, it's simply not possible to validate it only on simulator and then just submit it to the app store and it will not work like that. Uh, so here you would usually have a smaller set of tests that are focusing on um, a few user journeys that are the most important for, uh, for your application, for the success of your application and also cover all those APIs that are available only on your device. So you will kind of try to keep it to a minimum. And uh, uh, the reason this is so big is because usually, although it has a last test, it's uh, way more resource consuming for you to create such a, uh, such a test. And then on top of that, there is yet another topic, and this is quality of experience. Uh, this is something that started to come came up uh, to come up only a few years ago, and uh, people are uh, caring a lot about that in the smart TV test automation at the moment. So it's getting a lot of traction. And uh, what it means is that um, quality of uh, experience is basically how you. Uh, how your user perceives your application, how your users can um, can um, would uh, kind of uh, apprise your application if it's running fast, if the loading time is good, if the video didn't take too much time to uh, to boot and so on, and also what is the quality of my video stream? Is it blurry? Am I getting uh, this pixelated uh, um, rectangles there? Or, or uh, is my audio clear and, and loud and so on? So this is extremely important for customer retention in the field of uh, video on demand uh, services. So it is very important to also cover at least, uh, at least in manual way, if you don't have any tool for that, quality of experience. And there are actually quite a lot of tools now that, that can do that for you. I already mentioned Headspin, our friends uh, that are doing uh, doing just that. And uh, um, yeah, they, they have a very nice tool for quality of experience. So um, next topic, what, what is next? What, uh, what next we can expect from the... Um, uh, from the test automation for living room devices. Well, uh, there is a Cisco report um, that by uh, that states states that by 2023, about two thirds of the connected TVs will be 4K. And why why is it important? Why 4K is important? Uh, well, you should understand that the time of life of a single smart TV of a single device is uh, extremely big comparing to other devices. So um, you can have your mobile phone for two, three years, usually maybe four. Um, 
and then most of the people will just replace it with a new one, right? So you don't need to, to take care of uh, mobile phones that are older than three or four years most of the time. Um, with the laptops, it's usually something between five and 10 years, right? When you will want to get a new laptop. But with the TV, it can go uh, up to 12 years and even more because most people just don't see an uh, incentive. Why, why would they want to, uh, to replace their uh, TV with something new because it still performs quite well uh, the way it is. And uh, the 4K is actually the reason for, for people to, to switch, to update to a newer device. And this is very good news for us because newer devices have way better APIs. They are uh, way more stable. They have way better developer tools. And uh, this will simply make our lives much easier when people will uh, drop those uh, old dinosaur devices. And another huge game changer is Apium 2.0. Um, I'm not saying it's just because this is an Apium conference. I, I really believe this is a, a game changer for the living room devices industry and for, for a few good reasons. Uh, first of all, Appium is going to introduce the driver ecosystem. I already mentioned that my expectation is that uh, vendors and enthusiasts, open source community will start adding new and new drivers for, uh, for platforms. So over time, we will gradually see all those weird and uh, exotic platforms covered with drivers for Appium 2.0. We will have a driver for Samsung TVs, LG TVs, and whatever you can imagine. And in the worst case, even if there is no such driver, you could just go and write it and you will have all the ecosystem that Appium brings with it, all those different uh, testing clients written in different languages. So you can choose whatever language you're comfortable, Java, Python, JavaScript, and write your test using that language. So this is awesome. And another one is a plugins ecosystem. Uh, this is a less known uh, feature of the Appium 2.0, but I think it's uh, uh, no less important than uh, the drivers themselves because it will allow you to run a different sorts of assertions um, on your uh, devices. So if you want to run an image-based assertion, you can have a plugin for that. If you want to um, do some quality of experience test, you can have a plugin for that as well to, uh, to just get this functionality easy and out of box. Uh, and I also expect that such plugins will start popping up once uh, Appium 2 release is there. And I can see from Git that the core team of Appium is pumping up betas very quickly now. So I would expect that uh, we should see this Appium 2.0 release uh, quite soon. And the last piece of information that I have for you today is uh, an announcement that I have to make about uh, Sweetest and Appium. We are um, building our uh, own Appium driver uh, for Appium 2.0. It's meant to be released in October and uh, it is going to support all the platforms that Sweetest can currently support. So uh, pretty much any living room device, any platform, um, that is out there, except maybe some extremely exotic stuff, uh, Sweetest is already supporting and we are bringing it to, to Appium by providing Sweetest uh, Appium 2.0 driver. So we are going to be among the first vendors who, uh, who delivers that. And even more than that, uh, we have a public device lab that we launched quite recently, uh, about a, half a year ago. And uh, this devices in our public device lab will also be available over Appium protocol. That means that you can pretty much connect to any TV in our lab um, by just specifying the correct Appium hub address in your uh, settings and then run your test on that device remotely. The same way as you would do uh, for browser testing, for browser stack or for um, for mobile testing with, uh, with some Appium hub, right? And that is already exist. 
So um, I hope you're excited about this. Uh, I know I am. And uh, this is the last slide that I have. So thanks a lot for your attention. And now we can uh, switch to questions. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Andy. So we have one question here um, that says, you mentioned the way APM running assertion is by grabbing the data from the API on the device. If the device doesn't provide the interface, does that mean APM doesn't in this case? Or is there other way to do it? Yeah, so uh, th that's exactly the case. So uh, Appium is uh, relying on uh, getting, uh, Appium needs to get some uh, the, the data for your assertion somehow from the device. If your assertion says that this button has to be green, we need to get the color of that button uh, before we can compare it with, uh, with your reference, right? And uh, the, the way it's done now is that Appium is using APIs provided by vendor, so for Android, let's say it's Espresso framework for um, Apple, it's um, XCUI test. And that is the only way at the moment how Appium can get that. Or for web, for web platforms, it's web driver protocol, right? So it's also built in into the browser. And uh, this is exactly why Appium 2.0 is such a, a great news because uh, it opens up uh, the gates, it provides an API for developers to create an, a new drivers and new ways to get data from the device uh, for you. So at the moment, you can uh, you cannot do it if device doesn't have such an API and there is no driver for it. And, and in the future, uh, you will be able to build your driver if you need, or you can wait uh, until a community does that or a vendor does that. Okay, there's another question. Can we also plug in our own device with Suites Public Lab and share across the remote team? Yeah, yeah, we have a public device lab and we have also a um, uh, private uh, or your own devices. We provide tools uh, how, how you can do that. Um, it's all described very well on our website. So just go to Suites uh, website and you will find all the information there. And there are quite a lot of tools uh, or quite extensive tools for sharing be between team members so you can access your devices remotely. Um, we don't have any more questions, Andy. Uh, I guess we can close out this session. So then thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Andy, for sharing your experience today. Yeah, thanks a lot.